some of these crashes at 200 miles an hour plus, there's no way a human would survive if the car wasn't absorbing a lot of the energy. Aluminum won't absorb that. Steel won't absorb that. Unlike metal, which crumples around the driver at the moment of failure, carbon fiber breaks away. It's very good for absorbing energy and not transferring it to the driver. These cars are designed to break away, and when parts break off these cars, they take energy with them. So instead of that energy transferring into the driver and hurting the driver, the energy goes away with the part as it leaves. Carbon fiber manufacture is as difficult as it is secretive. But the Zoltec Corporation is opening the doors of its Abilene, Texas factory for a rare look inside its operation. One of the strongest engineering materials in the world begins as a synthetic petroleum-derived fabric, not unlike nylon or polyester. We're standing here at the initial stage of the oxidation process, which typically stabilizes the man-made material, or the polyacrylonitrile, we call it PAN for short, the PAN material, as it's drawn into the first oxidation oven, begins to cook. And as it cooks, as it's drawn through this oven, the material starts to change color. What you're basically doing is driving off a lot of the other components, and the more carbon you're left with, then the more black the material appears to be. The slow burn causes oxygen from the air to bond with the carbon atoms, which go from a linear chain to a stronger ladder-like formation. After the stabilization process, the fibers emerge as a very strong 68% carbon material known as pyron. At this stage, this material can be used to create a brake for an airliner. Although pyron is tough enough to stop an airplane, Turning it into 100% carbon fiber calls for a lot more heat. This is one of our high temperature furnaces that we, where we complete the carbonization of the fiber. We have a total of five altogether, and in this furnace we drive out the remains of the hydrogen and nitrogen to bring us up to a full carbon fiber. This is really the most critical part of the process, because the temperature that we use defines exactly the modulus or the stiffness of the fiber and also the tensile strength. So it's very, very important that we keep really accurate control of the furnaces at this stage of the process. This time, the fibers are heated in the complete absence of oxygen so that they won't burn. Instead, the extreme heat forces the atoms to vibrate until the non-carbon atoms break away. Left behind are crystalline chains of carbon atoms. The carbonization process has now fused the carbon atoms into a very strong shape that will require great energy to break. The carbon fibers go through an electrochemical bath, which roughens the fiber surface and makes it more bondable for use in composites. Then, in a last step resembling a textile factory, the carbon fiber is wound onto bobbins. The fibers, each one about one-tenth the width of a human hair, can be cut like any thread. But when bundled into a core 50,000 fibers strong, they begin to flex their muscles. But how does carbon fiber go from this to this? First, the carbon fibers are woven into a fabric to provide multi-directional strength. That fabric is then draped over a mold of the vehicle itself, and they will apply resin to it and heat the whole thing up in an autoclave and cook it. The autoclave cooks the carbon fabric into a hard shell, with its shape determined by the mold. When you think about how it starts, to oversimplify it, it's a piece of rayon like what's in your shirt. And when you put it in an oven and you bake it, and you do it right, you get something that can survive a 200 mile an hour accident, and the guy gets up and walks away. Of course, carbon fiber isn't just for auto racing. It's making its way into high performance consumer cars and the strong light blades on some of the world's largest wind turbines. But the most dramatic use for carbon fiber is on Boeing's new passenger jet, the 787 Dreamliner, which debuts in 2008. The fuselage and wing structures are made almost entirely of a carbon fiber reinforced composite. The important thing about the carbon fiber is its strength 
and it's lightweight and it's corrosion resistant. Those are the three key drivers. So the actual Dreamliner will be much lighter in weight than if it was made out of metal. And that's increasing the fuel efficiency. That will mean more affordable ticket prices, even as the cost of fuel goes ever upward. Back in the early 70s, Boeing estimated that every kilo you took off the weight of an aircraft would save something like $100,000 in fuel cost over the lifetime of the aircraft. In those days, oil was three twelve dollars a barrel. Today's saving is potentially very much greater. While other airplanes must keep a cabin pressure equal to 8,000 feet above sea level, the Dreamliner, with its stronger airframe, will be able to maintain a much more comfortable 6,000 feet equivalent. And since carbon fiber will never corrode, airlines will be able to provide a more human mix of air in the cabin. No more dry eyes and throats at the end of a long flight. It's taken 50 years for it to finally reach a new aircraft. But the Dreamliner will be the most fuel efficient aircraft flying. And that's what carbon fibers was all about. Of course, carbon fiber is just a fraction of what carbon provides us. Try to imagine a world without carbon, or even a champ car without carbon. You can forget about the fancy hydrocarbon derived paint job. You won't be able to stop without the carbon brake pads. But that's okay, because you can also remove the methanol fuel, the rubber tires, the car body itself, and last but not least, the carbon-based leg form at the wheel. Just about everything that counts on this car, and in this world, is made at least partially of carbon. Carbon is crucial in forming the bonds that make up living things, and the stuff that certain living things like to make. Carbon is the most abundant element in the universe that forms solid structures. Of course, hydrogen and oxygen and helium are more abundant. Carbon forms structures. As a matter of fact, it's a very unique element. It's an enchanted element. <laughs> the key lies in the configuration and size of the carbon atom. What makes carbon so versatile is two things. Number one, uh, the amount of electrons that it has in its outermost shell, which we refer to as the valence shell, is four. And it's also in the first row of the periodic table, which makes it a very small atom. The carbon atom's four valence electrons bond with larger elements, such as metals, as they give up electrons. And smaller elements, such as gases, as they try to gain electrons. As a result, carbon forms an amazingly broad range of compounds. In fact, today there are probably over 10 million known carbon compounds. The most stable carbon-to-carbon -carbon bond is found in diamond, a crystalline lattice of pure carbon. Diamonds have extreme hardness because the carbons that exist within diamond have been compressed under extreme pressure over billions of years to form this interlocking network of tetrahedra. And this interlocking network of bonds between carbons makes this extremely, extremely hard material. In fact, the hardest naturally occurring material known to man. Carbon, with its unique bonding capabilities, is also the key element of living things. Thus the phrase, carbon-based life forms. Carbon is an ideal chemical element to be just stable enough to make the stuff of life and the chemicals with which life does business, but just unstable enough that it doesn't cost too much energy to get that chemistry going. It's this ideal combination of stability and reactivity that makes carbon the backbone of all living systems. With carbon providing the critical bonds, simple sugars become complex molecules like DNA. It's truly the element of life. Carbon-rich plant life of the prehistoric variety has proven one of our most powerful sources of energy. But can we find ways to burn it without increasing global warming?